Hello and welcome to my Terry Melcher and more podcast. Um, this video is going to look into the history of uh, 10050 Cielo Drive. I wanted to make this video in order to assess um, Cielo Drive in terms of considering the tenants who lived there as well as their contributions to the energy of the home. So this video was part of my last year's research um, for Terry Melcher and more, which is a limited TV script composing of 13 episodes in regards to the life of Terry Melcher. So it's a biopic series. Um, Terry Melcher was a public figure who was largely forgotten in history uh, and wronged, a man who contributed to American culture by acting as a pioneer of California sound. He's also known as being an American record producer, the first producer who produced the Beatles in America. He managed and produced bands such as the Beach Boys, Paul Revere and the Raiders, the Mamas and the Papas, the Birds, uh, and more. Um, so this script also concerns Sharon Tate, a woman whose murder has been exploited through the glorification of the Manson murders and the glorification of serial killers over true creators in America, which continues to be a problem. But um, before I get back to the purpose of this video, which is going to discuss Cielo Drive, um, I want to encourage everyone to head to Deborah Tate's website, noparoleformansonfamily.com, to just stay updated on parole hearings of Manson followers who are still alive and in prison by signing petitions and writing letters or emails to the governor of California in order to keep them in prison. Uh, Sharon Tate has a lot of millennial fans and admirers, but if you truly love and care about this woman, you will participate in a legal contribution to get Sharon the justice she deserves. So now let's get back to Cielo Drive. In 1941, architect J.F. Wadkins designed a French-style country house at the end of a cul-de-sac in the Santa Monica Mountains that overlooked Beverly Hills and Bel Air. The first tenant to have lived there was Michelle Morgan, a French actress who lived at Cielo Drive from 1941 until 1945 where she decided to return to France after a failed career in the United States, but also because the wartime was over. Dr. Hartley Dewey and his wife Louise purchased the property after Morgan. The couple rented the home to famous tenants, including Baroness de Rothschild and silent film star Lillian Gish, who lived there with her mother. Gish survived the plague, never got married, or had kids. There's an image of her in her bedroom with a mirror behind her bed, so it's safe to say that she had her fun and was a saucy little minx. <laughs> I'd also like to mention that as I was researching this, I zoomed into a shadow in this image which resembles a killer holding a knife, and it really freaked me the F out. Now, although there were many famous figures who had lived there, little is known about the tenants who lived there between 1946 to 1962. The property was rented on average once every two years. In 1963, Rudolf Altabelli, also known as Rudy, a talent manager to the stars, purchased the property for $86,000 and rented it to lots of famous actors and musicians. Mr. Altabelli rented the home to an endless number of A-listers, such as Samantha Egger being one of them. Newlyweds Cary Grant and Diane Cannon moved to the secluded French country home during their honeymoon. In the summer of 1966, Mr. Altabelli rented the home to Terry Melcher, a music producer at Columbia Records, who lived there with his girlfriend Candace Bergen, an actress, and his friend Mark Lindsay, who he managed musically with regards to Mark's involvement in Paul Revere and the Raiders. Mr. Altabelli visited Terry and Mark to warn them about the spirit of a woman who committed suicide in the home after discovering her husband's infidelity. This tenant is not known, but he told them to watch out for the spirit of a jealous woman and not to keep girls around too long. It's safe to say that Mr. Altabelli was fantasy prone, given that he was largely interested in the occult, and one of his psychic friends uh, was Peter Herkos, who was the same man who did research uh, on the Manson murders. Uh, but that's for another video. Now, here is an extract from Mark Lindsay's Facebook page in which he discusses this in more detail and says, quote, he said that although the femme fatale spirit still lingered, she probably wouldn't bother two guys, although he warned that she didn't, didn't seem to tolerate beautiful women very well. As long as you don't let your girlfriend stay over too long, you should be okay. End quote. 
I'd also like to highlight the prevalence of homophobic culture in the 1960s, given that Alto Belli was an openly gay talent manager at a time where it was deemed taboo. So although Mark Lindsay considered his words, Terry Melcher made nothing out of it and simply assumed that he just said that because he was gay and didn't want him bringing women over. As Terry's girlfriend Candace spent more time at Cielo Drive, Mark noticed that strange events happened in the home whenever she was around, leading him to question the spirit of the femme fatale trying to chase the pretty young blonde away. Here's an image of Altabelli talking to Bergen at the home. Mark Lindsay recounted the times when the sound system would inexplicably turn itself off, sometimes in the middle of the night when others were sleeping. He mentioned that Terry started taking downers during the day to sleep, and Mark himself put a 44 Magnum under his pillow each night. When Candace was out filming in 1968, Terry extended an open invitation to Dean Morehouse to crash in the guest room in the main house, and Tex Watson, a Manson follower who was responsible for the Tate and LaBianco murders, would visit and supply Dean with drugs. Terry would even let Tex borrow his Jaguar and credit card, mostly because Terry's friend Greg Jacobson had to be bailed out of jail. Terry Melcher had a very close relationship to his mom, Doris Day, and would tell her everything. Being the son of Doris Day, Terry knew about social climbers and industry opportunists, which is why he confided in her about Charles Manson. Charles Manson was an amateur songwriter and guitarist who Terry had met at his friend's house, Dennis Wilson's. Dennis Wilson was a member of the Beach Boys, a band that Melcher also managed and produced. Wilson offered to drive Melcher back to his place after a party, in which Manson came as a ride-along and sat in the backseat of Wilson's car. Melcher said goodbye, got out of the car, and deliberately didn't invite either of them inside. Although Manson didn't head inside the home, he learned that night that Cielo Drive was where Terry Melcher lived, a music producer at Columbia Records who had the power to sign him on and make his dream come true. Terry Melcher confided in his mother and told her about this. Doris Day did not like the sound of Charles Manson and encouraged her son to move out of the property and into her Malibu Beach house. Manson knew Terry had moved out. This is the truth of the story. The fascination and glorification of serial killers in America has displayed false narratives on the Tate murders and for the most part purports to display the truth of the events. This is mostly due to the glorification and romanticization of Charles Manson as being a figure of pop culture. Manson did not send his followers to murder Terry Melcher on August 9th, 1969. He knew Terry Melcher no longer lived there. It was the success that the home stood for, along with all the famous figures, who Manson often referred to as piggies, that was Manson's real target. There are many motivations behind the crimes, but I'll leave that talk for another time. By mentioning piggies, I'd like to remind everyone of the gruesome crime scene at Cielo Drive, which I'll talk about in a bit, where Pig was ridden in Sharon Tate's blood in front of the door. Pig was something that stood for I suppose, Hollywood royalty and the establishment. This was the term that Manson and his followers often used in regards to the rich and famous. And on a side note, having mentioned piggies, I'd like to remind everyone that Brian Warner, a musician known as Marilyn Manson, recorded some songs for his first album at Cielo Drive, inspiring Trent Reznor naming the studio Le Pig, it just goes to show that the energy of Cielo Drive, a home where Terry Melcher wrote and recorded a lot of songs at the sound studio, was preserved for musicians who came after him, one of them being Brian Warner. Now back to Cielo Drive. In February 1969, after Melcher and Bergen moved to Doris Day's beach house in Malibu, Mr. Altabelli rented Cielo Drive to Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate. Polanski and Sharon had been to parties at Cielo hosted by Terry Melcher. There were three to fo four phone conversations between Sharon and Terry asking about the lease as he had moved out three to four months prior. Sharon wanted to live at Cielo so badly and even called it her love house. On March 23, 1969, March visits Cielo Drive to grab hold of Terry Melcher. He wanted a record deal really badly. Jay Sebring, Wojtek Frykowski, Abigail Folger, and Sharon Tate Four of the five victims were at the home. Sharon was conducting a photo shoot with her personal photographer and friend, Sharok Katami. Manson knocks on the door, in which Hatami answers. Manson claims he's looking for Terry Melcher. Hatami informs him that this is the Polanski residence and that there was no Terry Melcher living there. Sharon approaches the door and asks, Who is it, Hatami? Sharon knew of Charles Manson, as she had seen him playing his guitar and flirting with girls at parties, and Charles knew of Sharon, too. 
She was a beautiful, famous, rich actress married to a powerful film director. No words were spoken, just an exchange of a painful gaze between Sharon Tate and Charles Manson, a pregnant woman who had a troubled marriage and a cheating husband, and an ex-convict who was given a second chance at life, who simply wanted to be a famous musician. There is more to the events that took place on this specific date, by the way, but if you want to learn about it, you have to let me finish my TV script as I'm suffering from writer's block and I only write when I'm happy with where my life is going. <laughs> so Polanski appeared in Life magazine photos after the crimes. He even asked photographer Julian Wasser, 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 sorry, not pronouncing his name right, to take some Polaroids and give them to a psychic to figure out who the killers were. Altabelli sued Polanski and Life magazine on the grounds that the photos ruined the property's resale value. Now, here are a few comparisons that I want to make about the tenants who had lived at Cielo Drive. Firstly, a woman committed suicide at the home after her husband cheated on her. This is a source deriving from Altabelli, and this took place during the Dewey years. Secondly, Candace and Terry's relationship wasn't always perfect. He was often unfaithful to her, and they had an open relationship. Thirdly, Roman cheated on Sharon regularly with other women, including a public affair with Michelle Phillips in March of 1969, just a month after moving into Cielo Drive, and not to mention, Sharon was heavily pregnant at the time. But Miss Kilburg's got another three on who the baby daddy is, and he's quite a character himself. Now for the relationship parallels. Actress Samantha Eager, who lived at the home prior to Terry, met her husband at a London nightclub. They eventually divorced. Actress Sharon Tate met her husband, Roman Polanski, at the London Playboy Club, and that's where they also got married. I now want to discuss brothel-like conditions that took place at the home. Not in too much detail, but I will quickly mention the orgies, sex tapes, and BDSM conditions, events which ultimately led to the destruction of the home and lead to the destruction of any building due to inducing bad karma. Roman forced his wife to have threesomes and make home sex videos for his friends, including sex with two black bisexual men against her will. There are also sex tapes of Roman with other women, which were all destroyed by the LAPD after the Tate murders. The only public claim they made was finding a sex tape of Roman and Sharon making love. We also know that there is a sex tape between Sharon and one of her ex-boyfriends, Steve McQueen, which was destroyed as Steve McQueen had visited the home a few days after the murders, to destroy all evidence. Actress Olivia Hussey, one of Altabelli's actor clients, who had a brief fling with Terry Melcher in the latter months of 1969, moved into the home a month after the Tate murders and was raped by her boyfriend, Christopher Jones, at the time. Christopher Jones alleges to have had an affair with Sharon Tate early on in March of that year, possibly after Roman's affair with Michelle Phillips, a member of the Moms and the Papas, who also had a brief relationship with Terry Melcher in the early months of 1970. But let's go back to Olivia Hussey, the actress who got raped by her boyfriend Christopher Jones at the Cielo home. I want to consider how her experience after the Tate murders can be connected to previous tenants. Sharon Tate was raped at 17 when she was on a date with a soldier in Italy. Roman Polanski had predatory tendencies and raped a 13-year-old girl years after his wife's murder. Roman Polanski also lost his mother to the Holocaust, so his karmic relationships with women were deeply flawed, considering that he had also lost his second wife, Sharon Tate. In 1994, Salo Drive was demolished and rebuilt. It was also changed to 10066 Salo Drive. Jeff Franklin, the producer of Full House, purchased the home. Franklin had also been accused of being verbally abusive, making sexually inappropriate remarks in the writer's room, along with sexual harassment claims. I have not looked into this. I'm simply referring to it so you can remember the energy of the home. I do want to say on a final note that the destruction of the home along with planting lots of trees are ways to get rid of previous energy of a building. I'd also like to mention... Uh, just in case you head to my Instagram page at Terry Melcher underscore and more, um, I have received a few hate comments and messages in the past as I largely explore Roman Polanski's work, particularly the making of Rosemary's Baby. I feel that it is a huge catalyst. Um, it was a film that it was ahead of its time. And, you know, about a year after his pregnant woman, his pregnant wife got murdered, um, and also, I normally wouldn't be saying this, but because this is 
a biopic, essentially. It's not like anyone would be stealing my idea because my plan for the script, um, the way I've written it, is based on true events. So I've divided the year 1969 into three separate episodes. And the first episode of 1969 begins with a Playboy After Dark interview conducted by Hugh Hefner, where he interviews Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate, where they talk about violence and films. And what's really interesting is that Roman says, I don't believe that violence in films can inspire true violence, which is really interesting considering that the Manson followers lived at a place where, um, you know, they lived at Spawn Ranch, and the Spawn Ranch was essentially a place where they used to film westerns. So they were exposed to guns and all of that. So um, it's quite an interesting way in terms of being a catalyst to start the first episode of 1969 that way. But I do have a lot of ideas for this. Um, I just have to get back to writing. But I, I really hope uh, you guys found this video informative. And let me know what else you'd be interested in.